The beauty of the mountains, the valleys, the lakes and rivers of British Columbia is world famous. Without our forests, what would be left? From the moss-hung lushness of the coastal rainforest to the open parkland stretching from the Okanagan to the Kootenai and north to the Caribou and even further to the vast stretches of spruce and aspen of our north country, the trees bring our landscape to life. They support life, too, in the form of animals, birds, and fish. We are also dependent on the forests for our livelihood. Ninety-three percent of our forests are publicly owned and are administered and protected by our government's forest service. They must be protected from the ravages of disease, insects, and fire, so the war against these enemies can never cease. Fire is the most spectacular and terrible of these. This is what it leaves behind. And when these burned snags have weathered and their blackened bark has fallen away, the picture is still not pretty. What is more, these dried out snags present a further fire hazard, ready at the drop of a match to once more set the countryside aflame. Add together the dollar value of all our other major industries and they still fall short of the income derived from timber. So the protection of our forests is everyone's business, aesthetically and financially. One of the major causes of forest fires is the carelessness of campers, hunters, fishermen, and motorists who don't use their ashtrays. Have you ever returned to one of your favorite haunts and been met with a scene like this? A scene that could have been prevented? Some fires are caused by industry. Fires along railway rights-of-way are usually quickly detected and extinguished, but they add to the total yearly loss of valuable timber. But our greatest single cause of forest fires is one that is quite beyond our control, lightning. Apart from its unpredictability, it has the nasty habit of striking along ridges or mountain tops in remote areas. Obviously, since we cannot hope to eliminate fires entirely, our best hope lies in spotting them early and putting them out as quickly as possible. To do this effectively, we must prepare to meet the threat by training, by planning our counter moves well in advance, and by doing everything possible to reduce the fire hazard. One of the great potential hazards is the tangle of limbs, tops, rotten wood, and general debris left behind after a logging operation. Unless eliminated, this slash will become tinder dry and a real danger to the standing timber that surrounds it. So, under the direction of the Forest Service, this slash is burned under prescribed conditions. When properly conducted under the direction of a trained burning officer, this burning not only removes the fire hazard, but improves the area for the important job of reforestation. To the untrained eye, the result may look a little horrifying, but notice here that the standing timber is untouched, and remember that reforestation will have the area green again within a very few years. Another form of danger, slash along roadsides, rights of way, etc., is also burned to reduce the hazard. Before the fire season arrives, men of the Forest Service test all pumps and equipment that will be needed. They demonstrate the latest equipment to men of the industry, the men who know better than anyone the waste and high cost of fires in the woods. Semi-permanent camps are set up in strategic locations and during the fire season are manned by young men, many of them students. They are trained in all phases of their work as suppression crews. From these are formed small helitac crews, helitac being a coined word made up of helicopter and attack. Helicopters are used a great deal, particularly to fly crews to otherwise inaccessible spots. Before the season starts, spots such as this are set up where they will do the most good. The firefighting crews learn how to work with the helicopter pilots efficiently and safely. In remote country where roads are few, access roads are punched through the bush. Designed for summer use and intended only for trucks and heavy equipment, they are not exactly freeways, but they serve their purpose. Rangers, intimately familiar with every woods operation in their districts, inspect the fire tools required to be kept by every logger. Most responsible operators, knowing that it is in their own best interest to do so, have far more than the legal minimum. 
The forest districts, together with the Protection Division and the Public Information and Education Division, erect warning signs and distribute these familiar reminders. When the fire season arrives, everyone will be up to his ears in work, so the springtime is used to pack food in boxes suitable for drop-by parachute to fire crews in inaccessible places. Each of these boxes is carefully prepared and contains sufficient rations for two men for three days. In British Columbia, the fire season begins on May 1st and continues until October 31st. During that time, everyone wishing to light a campfire must obtain a permit. There is no cost for these, and they are obtainable from your ranger station or from most sporting goods stores. Possession of a permit does not necessarily mean that you can light a fire anywhere or any time. Certain municipalities have their own regulations, as do federal parks. And, of course, when the hazard is extremely high, all fires may be forbidden. Now that the fire season has started, Forest Service lookouts all over the province are manned. The lookout men report regularly to the ranger, either by radio or telephone. Theirs is a lonely job, perched on a mountaintop and seldom seeing anyone during the whole summer except those who bring in their food. Continuously throughout the day, they scan the horizon, the hills and valleys that surround them, waiting for that wisp of smoke that could mean trouble. Aircraft, too, patrol the skies, and their job is heaviest immediately after an electrical storm. Usually when a storm passes through, its path can be plotted, and as soon as weather permits, the planes are in the air, cruising up and down the mountain valleys, flying a pattern designed to spot a lightning strike before it develops into a real disaster. Along the coast, the Forest Service maintains a fleet of boats, ready to shift fire crews wherever they are needed. And in the interior, landing barges are used on lakes and rivers where roads are non-existent. Logging companies and ranger stations throughout the province maintain weather stations, checked carefully every day so that reports of humidity, wind direction and temperature can be compiled into an accurate and up-to-date weather map. From this, the hazard in various districts can be calculated and the results broadcast especially to the forest protection officers whose strategy decisions are dependent on this information. Despite preparation, major fires do happen. The uncontrolled, all-consuming energy of a fire such as this is equal to that of several atomic bombs. Destructive, fearful energy, roaring and crackling and consuming oxygen at such a rate that it causes its own sustaining draft. Such a blaze can scarcely be overlooked, and the man in the tower plots its position with his fire finder, direction and elevation. On special photographs superimposed with a grid, he pinpoints the blaze, calls his ranger, with a big one like this, word goes up the chain of command and district headquarters is on the air. The first flare-up settles down and a breeze pushes it along. This one needs a planned, coordinated attack. A heavy fuel concentration lies in its path and the bulldozers are brought in. Their job is to cut out a fire guard, to push aside the timber and the deep layer of organic matter that lies on the forest floor until the mineral soil is exposed. Pumps are brought in, set up in creeks and ponds, and the business of wetting down the edges begins. Heavy equipment is invaluable, but still the man on the ground is vitally important. After the initial attack has slowed down the spread of the fire, encirclement is the main job. Surround the blaze with a fire guard. More bulldozers are brought onto the job, working ahead, trying to make contact with others coming from the opposite side. Following the dozers, Men with shovels remove every root that might lead the fire across the guard. Next, fires are set up along the guard to burn in toward the main fire. This destroys the fuel in the path of the main fire. The center is allowed to burn itself out, but around the perimeter, hot spots develop wherever the fuel is heavy. These must be contained. Companies in the area send help in the form of trained men and equipment. Forest fire protection officers and trucks equipped with two-way radio direct operations. It's like a battle, a holding action against an attacking enemy where tactics vary every time. 
Gradually, the fire is contained. The guard completed, but the fire is not yet out. Hoses are laid along the guard, and hot spots that may send sparks across the guard must be extinguished. In the daylight hours, when the humidity drops, everyone concentrates on holding the line. This is the danger time, and often the wind rises in the afternoon. At night, controlling action is taken, and gains are made. The job may go on for days. Camps are set up at strategic points, where the firefighters are given hot food and a needed rest. Yes, every fire is different. It all depends on the ingredients. Has there been a long dry spell? What species of timber are involved? What's the weather forecast? Is it possible to get equipment on the job quickly? One innovation that has done much to help in holding actions is the air tanker, often miscalled the water bomber. The huge Martin Mars, a World War II flying boat, is one of this breed and two of them are maintained by a group of timber companies. For regions having numerous lakes and rivers, the Canso Amphibian is the answer. Four of these are under contract to the Forest Service. By taxiing along any convenient river, lake or inlet, these planes can pick up 800 gallons of water at a time. If fresh water is used, it can be mixed with a fire retardant in the plane's tanks, and in areas well supplied with lakes, they can deliver loads at intervals of about eight minutes and as many as 50 loads before returning to their base for refueling. Another aerial tanker used in BC is the Avenger. Originally a carrier-based torpedo bomber in World War II, it is particularly well suited to dropping loads of long-term fire retardants in canyons and other difficult areas. Eleven of them are under contract to the Forest Service and their principal bases are all in the interior, Kamloops, Castlegar and Smithers. Owing to admirable organization, these aircraft can take on a 500-gallon load of retardant and be airborne again within five minutes. A word here about retardants. There are several now in common use, and new ones are constantly being developed. Basically, they consist of a fire-retarding chemical, a kind of solution that coats the foliage of the trees and actually prevents ignition. Most of these chemicals are colorless and the various shades we see in them are added dyes which help define the areas already treated. That they actually do their job is seen here. The retardant has protected slash while the adjoining area has burned to a crisp. These chemicals do no harm to the forest. In fact, their chemical components will act as fertilizers when new growth begins. While they make a temporary color patch on the landscape, this will disappear with the first rain. Another development, possibly surprising, is the use of rolls of unperforated toilet paper dropped from planes as markers on fires which they have reported. Spotting planes drop the rolls to indicate to ground crews the quickest and most direct way to the fire, rather like a paper chase. Other aircraft seeing the paper will know that these fires have already been recorded. We have spoken about helicopters transporting small suppression crews to fire locations, but they are also used in ferrying larger groups from lakes to which they have been flown by fixed-wing aircraft. And if the firefighting crew must remain in an isolated spot for several days, helicopters carry supplies to them, but if the helicopters are too busy elsewhere, the prepackaged rations may be dropped by parachute. The men in protection work are always busy improving old methods and devising new ones. Some of these seem so simple and yet are so ingenious. One called the monsoon bucket is simply an oil drum with a tripping device that can scoop up a bucket full of water and drop it on the hot spot of a fire. Despite the use of modern and sophisticated equipment, 
The final wearisome job of extinguishing any fire depends on the man on the ground, on his own two feet and with his hand tools. He wets down the smoldering logs and trees until the steam rises and eventually even that subsides. He hacks his way along the fire guard, making certain that no smoldering root is biding its time to start everything up once more. And when the fire is finally out, what then? Is the whole story black mess a total loss? The losses are tremendous, of course, make no mistake about that. But it is possible by moving quickly to salvage something from the ruin. Before the insects and rot have time to establish themselves, loggers extract what they can, some of it good, some fair, and some poor. As soon as they have retrieved what they can, reforestation begins, the planting of the next crop which will be harvested some 80 years hence. But let us not minimize the losses. Apart from the timber itself, there is the time wasted, the labor wasted, the equipment burnt up, and no matter how far you think you are removed from the timber industry, it all means money out of your pocket. The forests do come back. This is an area of the Sayward Forest near Campbell River in 1952. On the left side of the road, young planted seedlings are already 10 or 12 feet high. Yet this is the area where the devastating fire of 1938 wiped out some 75,000 acres. Twelve years later, in 1964, that same road looked like this, a growing forest. Now the ugliness is covered and beauty restored. And so, everywhere in our province, with proper management of our forest resource, we harvest the timber and still, in the long run, retain our prime asset. But fire will always be with us. Obviously, it can never be entirely eliminated. Nevertheless, new ideas, new methods, and new inventions will make the task continuously easier. Already, tests are being made with an infrared scanning device that will search out any hot spot invisible to the human eye or when the smoke from an existing fire obscures the ground. The day may not be far distant when man-made satellites equipped with ultra-sensitive television cameras will be able to alert us to newly born forest fires. But let us not count too much on science or technology or automation. The human factor is always with us. Remember, forest protection is everybody's business, including yours.